Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>, y'all. Howdy. Fine till now. Many of you have not. Many of you have not seen me wear this hat. No. It's a pretty good hat. life up till now. It's a great hat. I used to live in this hat. Yes, he did. Yeah. I've seen that hat. I've seen, seen that hat. hat. And the other day, it's a great hat. And the other day, I went out to lunch with uh, a couple of my old friends. They were both cowboys. They have uh, grown up and they they grew up in this town, and uh, they worked silver and uh, ride a lot of horses. And, Heard a lot of cows, <laughs> and I was sitting there at lunch, and I was looking as I normally do. And I had both of them had these big, greasy, sweat-stained, <laughs> dirty hats on, <laughs> like this one. Not as good as this one. <laughs> uh, so I decided after I got home, I was gonna, I was gonna put this on, and uh, Linda and Jr. were over in the house. So I put the hat on, I went over into the house, and JR went ballistic. <laughs> As he should. Yeah. I mean, he came up off the couch and he was in attack mode. <laughs> you wore that hat in New York, too. Yeah. Um, but he, he, he figured out who it was. And then he was embarrassed. And then he was embarrassed. <laughs> Is this why you're growing your hair out? Is that part of that? Yeah. <laughs> but I bring this up because this is this is uh, this is the, this is a very interesting thing to me. It's something that I've spent most of my life worrying about and thinking about, and that is the difference between uh, meaning and understanding, hmm. you know, because uh, we, we very often confuse those two terms, <clears throat> and we often think that they are mean the same thing, and they don't. J.R. got excited because I changed the context. You know, I put on this hat which was the only thing that he could see. And he didn't, it was something that he was totally unfamiliar with. He's never seen me wear a hat like that before. And so he had to learn that part of my context includes his hat. <laughs> Not as much as it used to, but it, do, it does. Um, Wittgenstein said, don't look for the meaning. Look for the use. Who said that? Wittgenstein. Oh. In fact, the whole Philosophical investi Investigations, which was published in 1953, has to do with that subject. About how the meaning that we have towards certain words is really a contextual one. And it's dependent upon use usages. Um, I am very familiar with this because I have spent probably mm, most of my life, maybe all of my life, being confused, trying to figure it out. Um, I remember when um, I first went to graduate school and I had to attend a certain number of classes, just like it was, it was set up just almost like any other undergraduate program. There were certain required courses that I had to take, and I had to, you know, take some additional credits and stuff. And uh, I felt totally out of it, because I was dealing with a department and teachers with whom I was really not familiar and they were teaching subjects which were fairly abstruse to me. And I was totally unfamiliar with the terminology. Um, and 
I really struggled with that, and I felt very <laughs> less than and uh, somewhat alienated by the whole thing, and I was trying to catch up and figure it out, and it was difficult. It was very hard. Um, but over a, a period of time, as I sat through these classes, and they were talking about, you know, stuff like logical positivism and phenomenologicalism and, you know, all this other stuff that, that I was totally unfamiliar with. Um, and I still don't know what those terms mean. <laughs> but I know how they're used. You know, I learned that. I learned how to use them and how to listen to it. And eventually I started getting something out of all this stuff. Um, the same thing happened to me when I started practicing Zen. Because I did, really didn't know very much about Zen. I came to Zen because I like samurai movies. <laughs> Big plus. <laughs> and secondly, secondly, uh, I had spent a, a lot of time as a hospice volunteer and was very interested in death and dying. And um, I had discovered that, that Buddhism was the only place where I could find anything out about that sort of thing. So um, I went down to the ark and I bought a cushion and a zabaton and I started sitting by myself. I mean, I had a I had a book that was written by a Jesuit who, who taught me how to sit and how to practice Zazen. And it had a lot of illustrations in it and it was very helpful. I, I think I may still have that book. Um, and I sat by myself for a while and then eventually wound up at Jones and uh, sat over there for two or three years and went down to Albuquerque and sat with Jitsudo until, well, that was for seven years, and then came back up here. But over that period of time, uh, I learned how to speak Zen, more or less. Um, there were lots of things, there were lots of things that I did not understand. Uh, Zen has as many words that I did not understand as did the logical positivists and the phenomenologicalists. <laughs> Buddha nature, emptiness, uh, the absolute, the way, the Tao, all these words were basically meaningless to me. But over a period of time, I was exposed to them often enough, heard them often enough, that I acquired a usage of them. Not that I had understood the meaning of them, but I, I acquired a usage of them. And I found, out, I, found out, I found out that there were a lot of things in this practice that uh, <clears throat> were like that. Uh, I started koan study. I don't know, it was a couple of years after I got there. Um, and I started koan study, and I was studying, of course, with the Jitsudo Sensei. And uh, I acquired a certain facility with koans. And it had nothing to do with anything that I understood, but I did have a usage for doing koan study. And then uh, 
Musai uh, became a Hoshi, and that meant that I could go to, I could take koans to him, because he was allowed to do koan study with students. And I came, I, I would go to uh, Musai every once in a while, and I always flunked. He always flunked me. Pissed me off. Which you let me know. Of course. I, I don't keep any secrets. Um, and I learned something very important there. Because, you know, I, I always encourage students to go out and present columns to different teachers. Because you can get into a koan rut. <laughs> you know, you learn how to present a koan to a particular teacher, and over a period of time, you learn unconsciously uh, what they want and how to present it and what they, you know, what they like. And then you walk in and present a koan to, to another teacher that you don't know that you've never presented a koan to, and it's totally different. It's really quite edgy to do that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you also learn a great deal about the teacher, and you learn a great deal about yourself, mm -hmm. and what you're doing, you know. So I would go up, and I would, he was, Musa, I was in a room on the second floor, I'd go upstairs, and I'd present a koan to him, and he'd flip me. I really had to take a look at that. Well, eventually, of course, Musai became my main teacher. And I figured him out. <laughs> I figured him out. You know? And, uh, but I understood that I, what was going on. I knew what was going on. And every time I had the opportunity, like when I would go to Salt Lake City or somebody would come and visit us, I would present a koan. Yeah. And uh, I would have a, I even had a list of traveling koans. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to spend a lot of time memorizing them or anything. <laughs> and there are koans that I'd already presented anyway, so who would? You know, well cared. So I would just go in and present a koan. You know, it's amazing how much you can learn from presenting a koan to a teacher. And uh, so I encourage you to do that whenever you have the opportunity. I think it's, you know, I think it's a very good thing that, that we have two teachers here that you can trade off on. And very, you know, most of you guys trade off on us. And I think that's a very good thing. I mean, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, I'm going to tell a story about you because it fits exactly what you're saying. You came in with a call and you presented it to me. And from my perspective, it was a perfectly awful presentation. Now I just said no rang the bell. You got really mad. And what you said was, well, Jitsuda would have passed me on that coin. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, could be, but... <laughs> that's true. That's and, true. That, and that's a good reason for not taking, for if you start on a coin, you keep the that's right. teacher on that coin. That's right. That's true. Well, Zen is very much like that. I mean, Koan study is sort of a microcosm of Zen. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, every once in a while I'm asked, you know, well, what is Zen? <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm never sure as to how I should answer that because I don't know how to answer that. Um, I could, you know, I, I could hem and haw uh, about the fact that, that Zen could be said to be a combination of, of Chinese Taoism and Indian Buddhism with uh, 
dash of salt and pepper from the Japanese. I mean, you could define it that way. Uh, you could talk about, um, as, many, as many people do, about whether it's a, a practice or it's a philosophy or a religion. Um, but it's virtually impossible to cover all the bases. And it's virtually impossible to try to convey that to somebody else with words. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we teach is that the imminent <coughs> is very much present in the transcendent. Now, what do I mean by that? <laughs> it means that there is an identity of the relative and the absolute. It's also reflected in a, in a very well-known koan, which is, is um, case 19 of the Moomin Khan. And Joshu goes to Nansen and says, what is the way? And Nansen said, Ordinary mind is the way. And I've often wondered why, okay, if ordinary mind is the way, why don't we call the way ordinary mind? You see? Well, it is ordinary mind. But it is ordinary mind plus a lot more. And a lot more is the thing that Nansen couldn't convey, I can't convey, nobody can convey. When I think about this, I think about music. Because A lot, of under, a lot of how we understand or that we convey meaning is a lot like listening to the melody in a piece of music. Because we're all familiar with the fact that, you know, the notes can be described in physical terms, in terms of their amplitude and their wavelength and the sound that they produce, the physical aspect of the notes. But for some reason when these notes are strung together, we also recognize that there's a melody that transcends the physicality of the notes. So the question is, what is this melody that we're listening to? Now, there are some people who are very unmusical who can't recognize the melody or have trouble with it. There are not very many. Most of us recognize some sort of a melody. And the question that I would like to ask is, what is that melody? Does it exist? Is it a figment of our imagination? Is it totally in our mind? Or is it out there somehow? <clears throat> because after all, we all recognize the same melody. <laughs> but it's something that transcends the notes. And it conveys emotion and feeling. You know, I got this from my first piano teacher. I was very good with my fingers. I could play all the notes, but there wasn't any feeling. You know, it's a big difference. <clears throat> if you ever watch Ixok Perlman play the violin, you know what, how that, how he does it. I mean, he is totally into the piece. <clears throat> He's identical with the piece. He's inseparable from the music. Well, this 
this is what I'm talking about when I talk about Zen. Yeah? Because Zen, my understanding of Zen is all of the different ways in which I have used that word and have watched other people use that word. Uh, it, it, it embodies not only service, koan study, zazen, all the various aspects of this practice. It also involves all the poetry, all of the painting, everything else that is associated with it. There are hundreds and thousands of different ways to use this word and in different contexts in which you find it. Now after a, a period of time, if you think you're really clever and intelligent and arrogant, you might try and sit down and define the term, write a definition of it. There's a new book that was published recently called uh, The Princeton Encyclopedia of Buddhism. Uh, you know, for years we have had the Shambhala Dictionary of Buddhism, which has been an extremely helpful and useful thing. But it's also had a lot of gaps in it. There have been a lot of words that I've gone to that dictionary for and I couldn't find them. Well, the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism has 5,000 entries, it's 1,300 pages long, and it's a million words in length. And it contains all those words that I couldn't find in the other dictionary, plus a lot more. But, you know, you may come up with the greatest definition of Zen in the world, you're still not going to be able to embody its use and all the different ways in which it is used. You know? In other words, I've got a, I bought the dictionary, I bought the encyclopedia, of course. I mean, how could I not? Uh, 37 bucks on a Kindle, for God's sake. And, but, you know, I bought it because it's a quick reference. But I'll tell you something. It's lifeless. Hmm. You know? It's dead. It's dead in the water. <clears throat> it's useful. It's helpful. But it's dead. So, try to find the melody. That's all you have to do. And I don't care if it's Zen, or if you go to, to in your travels, you go to France, or you go to England, or any place else. If you get a new job, whatever it is, there's a melody. And all you have to do is learn how to sing along. <laughs> In the beginning, it may be just humming, but eventually you'll learn the lyrics. <laughs> Great analogy. Thanks. <laughs>